I'm surprised to see so many people here, in fact, a bit nervous. I thought uh, I agreed readily to deliver the keynote address last because I thought most people would be leaving. I mean, so it makes it easier. Now, uh, I'll wait for a few minutes before I do something, but I usually take a photographic, a pho uh, mobile photograph of the crowd to convince a lady. Uh, I'm trying to convince for the last 40 years. Okay. Uh, you know what's the most dangerous word in that topic? The most subversive, the most dangerous, the most explosive word that's hidden there in the topic? There's one word that often contradicts everything else. It's a word public. Now, how on earth do I know it? Well, about 45 years ago, I was in the corporate sector, and my friends who retired from there, uh, retired with an obscene amount of money. Um, well, I, life's a series of mistakes, so I got into the IAS. Now, having gone through it, the first thing we learned is that you're handing something public, and a public commodity, a public idea, a public space, a public policy is necessarily booby-trapped. Booby-trapped. You don't know what's going to come next because uh, one of the speakers was saying that, uh, who was it, uh, saying that uh, organized those um, exhibition at Sassoon Docks. Uh, Akshat was saying that he's organized and uh, it's only when he went there that he realized that there were other, other contending communities. Only when he went into the field. So the word, I'm starting with this uh, word of caution, but at the same time, a lot of encouragement to Hari, to Yamini and others. Let this very fact not frighten you. Let this be a point of launch. And I'll give you a couple of examples of public art. The first example I'll give you of public art was the most controversial public building that was ever made in the history of India. It made the Indian treasury bankrupt. It was made by an emperor in the name of his wife, who certainly um, doesn't appear well, doesn't matter, it's his choice. So he made uh, this in, his na in her name, and the treasury went bankrupt, and uh, lots of stories are there, lots of facts are there. So, so revolting with the whole idea of squandering money over that public building that his son imprisoned him and earned the reputation of being the most hated figure. Had it not been for him, his father's father's extravagance and the son's son imprisoning the father, a lot of political elements in India would not get the necessary fodder. Now, having said that, I'm talking to Shah Jahan. Uh, as culture secretary, we made, uh, I'm sorry, when I was culture secretary, we made these, uh, some of these projections. And one of the projections was that how many times has the cost been paid through tourism? It's not only the symbol of India, not only the symbol of India, Taj Mahal, it remains India's pride of all the symbols that we have. But more important is it's economically feasible, economically profitable. I've chosen a, way, a historic example only to drive home the point that Shah Jahan was criticized for at least 200 years, next 200 years for that godforsaken building. And uh, one of the objections would perhaps be by the accounts department that he didn't take lowest tender, <laughs> they went standard PWD yellow colors, the unimagination, non-imagination of government had not crept in enough, whatever. The other building that I had passed on to Hari just now when we were talking, was Santa Papadu. Santa Papadu in 
Paris, uh, broke all, shattered all norms. I am calling it public art because though it's a museum and a museum is necessarily associated with, pri with, with the private sector of arts, with the closed arts, this one was made public by disemboweling it and bringing in all the intestines out of the building. It horrified the French in 78. The government almost uh, lost their majority. So terrible was outroar in Paris, in other parts of France. It was called an obscenity. Now, right now, when I ask, uh, when I used to find out from the French, they say two places in Paris that must be visited is the center, center, center Pompidou, which they call Beauberg, Beauberg, to pronounce it the right way, Beauberg, if, and the Eiffel Tower. Coming back again, the Eiffel Tower that was built on the, in the centenary year of the French Revolution. So that was 1789, this was 1889, was also considered a rather obscene structure, uh, an aesthetic structure, an engineering uh, pylon uh, gone crazy, etc., etc. Now, this, so what I'm trying to put forward as my first point is, despite the public reaction to a well thought out art projection in the public domain, there have been the best examples in history have is that if it is well thought out, if it is aesthetic, aesthetically pleasing, of course that's a very difficult question, but aesthetically pleasing to almost everyone, it outlives criticism. That's a simple point. Now what would be public art? You know, uh, while uh, trying to update myself, I found that the Latest work in this domain has been made by uh, New York two years ago by what they call the Advisory Commission on Art. It's actually a bigger name, Advisory Commission on Public Art, Buildings and Markets, Sculptures and Markets. And this New York Advisory Commission was set up by uh, the mayor with very eminent persons. And in six months, they submitted the report uh, the report says this and it says that. So they couldn't really come down and put their, put their finger on what constitutes public art. What exactly is public art? I've gone through the report. Uh, following that, this was 2017, following that in 2018 last year, they had this uh, art in the open exhibition of all the public spaces of consequence, public Art, art in public places of consequence in New York, which was a roaring success. There you are. We have pundits, we have scholars, we have practitioners, we have everyone trying to get together and there's no unanimity. Now, isn't that a good thing? Isn't that a good thing? I find discourse and debate to be far more interesting than the stereotype clicking off jackpots. And art has this inbuilt genetic um, genetic rebellion built within it. So if they haven't been able to come to a conclusion, it doesn't mean that there's no broad area of agreement. There is some amount of broad area of agreement. Now, we had this lady from Google. What's her name? Avnita. Is Google public art? Is Google public art? It qualifies, A, as art in the public domain, okay? The fact that it's digital and not corporal doesn't really come in the way. Would it be, uh, would it be militating against the concept of art being something that we need to feel or we need to we need to we need to see for ourselves uh, 
So digital art is a new domain, as all of us know, and the digital presentation of legacy art, let's call it legacy art, is another question by itself. So let's start on the eliminations. A, I would submit that public art is, has unrestricted access. That's the first, first dominating, dominant feature would have to have unrestricted access. The word unrestricted, listen, I'm a bureaucrat, so I can, I can confuse you <laughs> if I want. So unrestricted access, and after 42 years as to that. So uh, unrestricted access, would an airport be unrestricted access? I would say yes, because the restriction of entry to the airport is not for the art. The restriction is for other reasons. So when the restriction relates to the display, it sort of comes, militates against public art. That's my submission. And that's how I'd explain to the union ministers. Now, so one we come across, so that's one. The, is it, is it uh, the, when, whenever we use the word public art, herein before, till before, till before, uh, Anish came up with his cloud bean and other things, it usually meant graffiti. Public art was associated necessarily with graffiti and public expressions of revolt, of protest. We didn't have much graffiti in India, nothing to bemoan. Some of it can be really defacing. Uh, at the same time, we didn't have that creativity coming in. Now hold your horses. Creativity and India, uh, there's a linkage which is far deeper than the Indian genetic propensity to dirty up a public place. It's stronger. Creativity is a stronger genetic impulse and that can be seen from the ritual art that we have had, the wall arts, the floral arts, every person was, every group, however uneducated, was trained or propelled to move forward to express, and this was mainly in the, mainly the female gender, express her thoughts, her expressions, where formal education was not required. The spontaneity of expression continued unabated, and the mother, daughter, there, there were no copying. I've seen it in Oslo, there's no copying, they have, they have two different styles. They all keep it within a normative structure. In other words, worldly painting would be of a worldly type. You can bring in uh, Aboriginal painting of, this thing, uh, of, of Australia there. You couldn't use. But if you compared the paintings, ritual paintings of the Gonds, and the Aboriginal paintings, there is a striking amount of similarity because both deal with pointillist art. They both are pointillistic, both relate to lizards, uh, dry area subjects, turtles, lizards, and stuff like that. So we have this issue. So we start freeing up the space to understand what is public art. I have first said that it surely has to be unrestricted. That's one. B, the medium is inconsequential, at least now. We can't sit in 2019 and contest the digital media. The digital media is as much physical, more physical, I would say, than the immediate corporal, the immediate thing we can touch. The best example, put five persons together, put two persons together, they'll talk to each other for just two minutes and then they are on the digital. It's not a fault. We keep accusing each other of being unsocial, distractive, um, attention deficit syndrome. We keep accusing each other because the cultural framework from which we emerged necessitated a certain amount of social interaction because at that point of time, the physical social interaction had its own therapeutic value. You must realize that each act in society has its own 
long a tradition has to survive on certain yardsticks, certain positives, positives. And I'll just digress for a minute and give you an example. As a young officer, I, had, I was serving in Asansol, which is a dry area. And uh, since there were no water resources, water sources close to these villages, the woman had to walk about two kilometers, a uh, certain number of villages, to go to the common uh, well, stone well. And uh, I did a brilliant thing brought in piped water and within a few months I heard of a lot of tensions that had come in within society. The mothers, mother-in-law, they were shouting at the woman, where on earth have you disappeared? The tap is just outside the house. Now what that means was that well served the purpose of female bonding. It was not only getting water. So let's not look at it from the utilitarian point of view. Utilitarian, utilitarian point of view. That was a bonding center. That was a psychological release play, a place of psychological release, which I had disturbed with technology. And therein after I had decided not to mess around with these things, not to stand in the way of modernization, but to think of the social audit before we committed ourselves. So the point I was making is that it has to pass certain normative, normative uh, tests. Uh, I brought in ritual art as a form of public art. I have even brought in a huge um, monuments of the type of, say, Eiffel Tower or Taj Mahal. Now, we need to start restricting it a bit. Would architecture qualify? Would architecture qualify? There's no reason why it shouldn't qualify, but if we want to study it academically, I would say we leave architecture and concentrate our limited energies on expressions, sculptures, paintings, engravings, whatever you have. So, now we drop architecture from the baggage. Now that's a matter of convenience. It's not a matter of semantics. It's not a matter of being academic. It's only we have to focus somewhere, otherwise we never get anywhere. So we would restrict, it's a, it's a progressive evolution of a definition and let it not be straightjacketed by anyone in any year because it has to keep pace with the evolution of our cognitive capacities, the technology that goes with it. If we don't allow our cognitive capacities to grow, if we don't allow it to flower, if we straitjacket it in one box, that's the end of art. That can be the beginning of compliance and compliance is in high demand now in India. You know, why, why blame India? The whole of many parts of the world. So, uh, compliance and art have, in my humble opinion, a binary a contest, and that is one of them. So, uh, this, I went through some of this, since there is a relationship between public art, the discussion on public art and airport, I traveled through some of the other airports, some of the most modern airports, to see how the character of a city was brought out. We had a fascinating discussion with the second group where they brought out, the uh, tried to bring out the heart and soul of, the, of Bengaluru. I would agree with one of the participants more where uh, she said that it is plurality and welcome first. The psyche of plurality and welcome first, the absorptive capacity, the plurality is what defines a fine city. Had it not been for its openness and plurality, there would be no flowering of IT and others from all parts of the India and the world. If there had been a minimal cultural imposition upon immigrants, it would not have happened. It would not have happened. So 
that would be a defining point. So when we're talking about the city, we have a causal relationship between the, the, the dominant feature and the immediately visible feature. I would submit that the immediate visible feature would be technology, the advancement of technology and others. But the feature that dominates the scene, that, that causes, that, that permits, that encourages, is the capacity to permit outsiders of all to come in for the advancement of science and technology. Had it not been there, so we can, I mean, I'm not going to get into that panel discussion anymore, but all I'm going to say is that that is representative of the city. Uh, there were discussions about um, what could be symbolic of the city. I leave it at that because it's a, it's a spectrum of symbols. A plural city can't have a single symbol can't have a single symbol. So there'll be different symbols, different things emerging. So that is for the others to decide. I was mentioning about San Jose, the Silicon Valley of America, and I studied there. Now, you see, one of the advantages of web is you can, you can surf if you want to. It's a little bit of patience, and if you are on technical uh, websites, you can visit them everywhere. So, San Jose has more than one airport, and I'm referring to what they call the Mineta Airport, which is the closest to the Silicon Valley, where they have come up with um, sculpture, which they call e-cloud. It's uh, lots of propellers hung up that are interactive in nature, and keep taking photographs of whoever passes under and keep reflecting them. Now don't ask me what the hell it's meant for. It works. People go there to see it, to see it. It's, it's a wonder kid and it has it. There's also another one that they have called Space Observer. That's also technological. So basically, this airport authority chose to go technical, chose to go high-tech, because it is the high-tech, undubitably the high-tech capital of the world. So it, it gives you a feeling the moment you go. I'm not sure how many people would be would have the time to savour whatever art objects are displayed because the sense of tension related to airports, the tension to get in, the tension to get out, but then there are an immense number of waiting places also. So we need to segregate that part, the waiting place where you have to wait for no fault of yours is perhaps the best place to get the public. You know, I've been to Saudi Arabia for a consultation and we found that uh, the Saudis, the Arabs, have come up with a uh, new, new uh, system only four or five years ago. They found that people, the pilgrims from all over the world who came to Mecca and Medina had necessarily to halt at certain places, common places, at night before proceeding the next day. And most people had limitations on uh, in the walking, walking capacity, so the distances were not too much. So once they came after, because many insisted on going on foot, otherwise what sort of pilgrimage have you done if you went by Rolls Royce? So this on foot, or the distances were not too much, and they had a lots of spare time lots of spare time which were used only mainly by religious groups in continuing their chanting. The Saudi government got in after this young prince, very controversial guy, uh, got in 
and they started marketing what is Saudi Arabia, where on earth have you come? Have you come by plane, you're coming into a, your target is Makkah and Madina, Makkah and Madina is not all of Saudi Arabia. So what is Saudi Arabia is being marketed at the spots where people have mandatorily to take rest. So that's another, another catchment area, if I may put it, that we need to bear in mind. Now, the first, the definition that the New York Arts Commission came up, one point struck me, and that is all public art, all generated public art, I don't know what that word generated means, I guess commissioned public art, is political. Is political. And there was complete unanimity. Now, we have to stretch the term politics to mean public policy or whatever is a corporate policy. In other words, what they were trying to say in American English was that it had a message in it. It was message driven. I mean, that's my interpretation. I'm not an American, but I guess they have their uh, own ways of speaking. I can't tell you. So we move on. All messages are political. Now, one of the driving aspects of public art in open areas, not necessarily commissioned, has been political. Graffiti was political, sloganing was political, and I really miss the decimation of the Marxists in West Bengal. I really miss them because as long as they were there when I was growing up, there was not a single wall that was dull. You had Soviet art all over the place, you had struggling, this thing. so everywhere they started with uh, sloganeering, they started with uh, words, alphanumerics, and then moved on to the visual. And the visual that they started mastering is something I'll miss, the Indo-Soviet art, or Soviet-influenced Indian communist art, uh, where uh, the, uh, the, the, they were always in an aggressive posture, Women and men were equal. In fact, the woman looked more, more equal. And it went on. They were all on fighting mode. So now, of course, in Calcutta, when I go past the reformed Kolkata, where there's, uh, we have a rather mercurial lady in charge, uh, her sense of, she's a poet, she's a painter, Balan Nambiar. Mr. Vasudev, you've got competition from my chief minister. <laughs> Good real competition. Now, her sense of aesthetics are apparently not, um, or maybe I am beneath her radar. I can't understand what she's trying to convey. So when I go along the main boulevards and roads, she has decorated the middle stretch with a lot of sculpture. And uh, I usually try to look at it like this. I mean, to avoid what I call visual pollution. Now, that is one area of public art that I would submit to all to be very cautious about. About thrusting of visual, thrusting of, uh, well, I would put it as unesthetic, thrusting art on the people. It's almost like um, shoving it with a lot of thing down your throat, whether you like it or not. But let me tell you that there have been more cartoons about her sculptures than, uh, than anything else. About, um, we don't. So one is the political statement. Uh, incidentally, these, these little, these harmless sculptures that I'm talking about, they're just obscene to the eye. That's all. They hurt the eye. Um, they hurt the eye, they are neither abstract nor uh, narrative nor historic. They're just there, that's all, and somebody made money out of it. Um, so that's one. Then does public art necessarily have to deal with the common denominator, the lowest denominator? Well, there's a, again a booby trap onto that. Uh, polychromatic art, multicolored art 
usually appeals to most except those who have not trained in let us say the abstract arts abstract art would be to the uninitiated something like uh, an acquired uh, taste like black coffee to acquire it uh, but then you would have to see it whereas abstract art i have my issues with abstract art because uh, i can't figure out half of what they are putting but then there are lots of abstract art that are understandable that are pleasing but polychromatic art that's uh, the type that uh, uh, i think naresh was mentioning about those cycle stands so poly multicolored art appeals to the people that's yours na suresh mr nair yeah, so the so a but does public art necessarily have to cater to the lowest denominator isn't it in charge of uplifting the aesthetics of the nation now who on earth gave you that duty it it's almost uh, as pompous as a pre soviet uh, pre liberalization bureaucrat who thought i i spent half my career there during that period so i knew that we knew everything when you saw one of us coming you didn't need to have encyclopedia britannica we knew everything exactly what was required and we sort of doled it out so for god's sake nobody is giving you this uh, this sort of a duty to educate them with uh, strong doses of black coffee <laughs> so uh, then comes the question of the monumental does it necessarily have to be monumental well there is a saying about the monumentality or the or the largeness of art but the finest piece that sort of broke all grounds and introduced public art as we are also here we are not graffiti but we are also here would be cloud bean now people who seen cloud bean or have gone under it would realize how much effort it took anish and like balan i have called him the world's most gifted blacksmith all he, he for some reason he he just uh, does a lot of welding of metal sheets everything is metal usually he deals with metal so the cloud bean is actually a metallic sheet that's gone around in a, in a, in a in very smooth curves but how on earth he managed to get the mirror finish on top is something he says he is not going to tell i plied him with liquids he said no i am not going to tell you so the liquids went to waste so <laughs> that's one area where he is not going to reveal how he has done it but the conceptualization the visualization the the guts to do it was his hmm, that's why he is he he made history but let me tell you despite the gimmickry despite the gimmickry or despite the attractiveness because everyone has to see cloud cloud bean and everybody has to take pictures underneath and above because there are two different reflection reflections if you stand here and you get your your uh, your visual up there it comes up on the surface shiny mirror and if you go underneath then also you get mirror effect so you do it uh the fact that mirrors and their immediate impact was also also known to us because we keep hearing of the hall of mirrors the uh, asiatic art had this fascination for mirrors as well now monumental with a purpose monumental with a message with a purpose with with a with a with an Uh, undubitable attractiveness about it not because we remember his uh, millennium project flunked flunked i mean that it's it's it didn't give him that amount of uh, goodwill if i may put it it just looked like an outsized meccano remember meccano toys something like that so it just looked like a piece of mechanos played randomly uh, it didn't sort of uh, that was one bad investment that mittal made now uh, 
we have used the term pleasing, we have used the term polychromatic, lowest denominator. What public art now is trying to message through, if you notice, is a sense of nostalgic. There's a wave of Bollywood nostalgia that is sweeping the country. Bollywood nostalgia, from coasters to cups to this and that, everything, those, those days of Bollywood have become some sort of a common pooled memory that we would like to cherish. Because that is the time when 42 nations of India came together to dance silly. But uh, they came, and that memory is being claimed by civil society as the memory of the nation. There is a competition, I, competition because there are small groups who claim that the memory of the nation actually goes back uh, from the time the earth came up, and because that's a time when their deities moved around with dinosaurs all around. So they trace it back to antiquity, and then we have this concept of uh, contemporary history. They, they clash. But this nostalgia and its, and its uh, repetition has also come in. Provocative. I've often asked, ki, how provocative can public art be? How provocative? We have, we have contained a bottle, the uh, educative part. Now, how much? It all depends on the context. It all depends on the context. If you, if you are within a context, if you are within that locality, with, the, with that audience, one can play. But given the uh, sweeping uh, mood of the nation, if I may put it, uh, because it's all monopolized by some, no? they decide what the mood of the nation. And some in black gowns have also taken on the duty. So now that's more dangerous. Uh, I can understand people in politics taking on, I can understand uh, policemen and creepy bureaucrats repeating. I can't understand how black gowns fall in, shell, fall in line. Now, the mood of the nation, so keeping that in mind, in other words, what I'm saying is, let me simplify it, there are sensitivities that one needs to guard against. We have spoken about this in the past, but I would submit that one can still outsmart them. That's the point I'm making, outsmart them. There are lots and lots of spaces where outsmarting is possible because the plurality of the country and the plurality of the city shall not be, will be allowed to be drowned under any homogenistic, uh, hegemonistic movement or urge. That would be my submission that would be my submission. Now, there are, uh, what does one do when one gets commonly, when, when most people get together and decide that this is just not on? Can we, are we captive to a public art that's already installed? Mercifully in India, we are not. In the recent past, Three, uh, what shall I say, three uh, uh, sculptures injurious to the eye they have been dismantled. They have been dismantled and they have, they have that has shown the way. So in a way, uh, Jack Boots have done uh, not too much of a bad service. Now, uh, one such sculpture I would have loved to dismantle if I, at the wherewithal. It came up when I was there in Delhi uh, looking after culture. Also relates to an airport. Now, people were talking about the international traffic, national traffic, not realizing that a lot of the national traffic is also international in their mind. So there are these things. I mean, in other words, we require to think of the cosmopolitan. The cosmopolitan rather than uh, bracketed. Of course, There'll be people who have never seen the inside of a plane also traveling, but they don't uh, jabber so much. Now, when I talk of cosmopolitan values, we need not succumb to Western, uh, what shall I say, 
uh, Western norms or Western uh, tastes or motifs. But for God's sake, let's be sensitive to some of them because they're not Western, they have now become universal. The pizza is not either Italian or American anymore. Pizza is universal. Just like the biryani which came from Central Asia is also universal. So let's, let's get this thing. This airport spent, again, unheard of obscene amounts. And Hari, that's a lesson for you. And the moment you get down in India or get down to the plane, you see the finger pointing out at you, the middle finger. Now, the middle finger, or for that matter, the finger is perhaps, pointing fingers are perhaps not the finest way of greeting people. We have Indian cultural norms. And one of the cultural norms, I was lecturing uh, this young lady, um, who had asked a question that one of the cultural norms that that uh, impress us the most is a lack of physical connectivity. If you notice, we don't go and either embrace two men don't kiss or forget kissing the other gender. So embracing, uh, hugging uh, both sides. Have you seen the Arabs going in for that? or the Soviets going in for that male case, which sort of nauseates me. Now, this sort of gender, I mean, within the same gender also, we don't show such endearment. Because we had to keep, keep to the norms of pollution and purity, purity and pollution. Much of it was based on hygiene at that point of time. The point I'm getting is if you have noticed, the psychology behind the Indian greeting is not to touch. I have firmly closed both my available arms, fingers, and I'm doing this to you as my greeting. To avoid even a handshake. That is the way our brains travel. Have you thought of it that way? That one of the reasons for this namaskar pose is that firmly closes all options for getting more physical. In any case, we, when, we had, when we had so many options available, even the namaskar would have been good enough. But who on earth, the, the, I had a quarrel with the airport fellows, the, the VK. they told me, Mr. Secretary, but that is uh, a mudra. Those are mudras. I said, for God's sake, I know what a mudra is, but uh, is that the only thing you could, need, you could find out to demonstrate? Imagine a foreigner just landing and saying all sorts of waving fingers. So it's the cultural nuances of the whole world or larger segments of the world have to be worn in mind when you're doing that. If the fingers were not bad enough, they've got an excess of gold shielding behind it. Uh, Baroque could be revolting at times, you know, Baroque could be pleasing, it could be revolting depending on what measures you are releasing it and depending on what you are adorning. But if everything was Baroque in the room, you would be revolted. So here was a Baroqueization of, 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 of art that I would submit to Hari and Imini. Please keep in mind, uh, you can go in for anything, I don't decide art and go in for everything. But uh, what about special groups? One of the most encouraging news that I read about Bangalore or Bengaluru is about the autistic artisans who are making waves in some of the finest multicolor, uh, simple drawings, but they're making waves. That autism is, doesn't stand in the way of expressing oneself. Nothing could come out better. They've gone international, they've gone national. So there is a, perhaps even a niche area for paying tribute to them and explaining. The, one of the major problems of culture and re, cultural relation or cultural narration is a lack of the signage is a lack of signage. The one that I used to point out most favorite 
is the first statue you come to the first museum of India. There is this black basalt lady, uh, well contoured, standing there, and it's written below, Tara, T-A-R-A, Circa, C-I-R-C-A, 12C. I said, what on earth am I supposed to make out of it? What on earth am I supposed to make out of this messaging? Tara means Tara. We could have simply written just a few lines in English and Hindi that this is Tara. She is a Buddhist deity, powerful Buddhist deity, who overstayed her visa in India and got domiciled. And that now she's taken as a part of Shakti, of the, of the female force. And that she was resplendent as a junction point between the lapse of Buddhism and the arrival of Brahmanical Hinduism. But anyway, that's too complex. So that Tara has her own place. Tara has her own place, so just a narrative of this little is required. Point is, when art is displayed, it is assumed that you were a first class postgraduate from the art school, all of us. So that's not the case. So let's take a little effort to explain. It is not banal, it's, it's required. It's required. And I, I lost much of my, I mean, I've wasted much of my time to explain to the ASI that other than those purple animal boards at every goddamn monument that they have, saying this is government pro protected property with no one around to see the protection. Hey, why don't you say what this monument is supposed to be? That board, it doesn't sort of frighten anyone. It doesn't frighten anyone. Anyone wants to do, uh, we, we have talked about it uh, recently, that common spaces don't frighten anyone. So there is no narrative. Wherever you go, you see it, you go past it, but you don't know. People in Delhi would perhaps know that they're going past a pepper pot every day. It's a Nizamuddin, there's a pepper pot. I mean, it's, it's, it's called a pepper pot by people. It's just a minar with a top, gumbad, that dome. What we are supposed to narrate is that this is the first Mughal architecture in India commissioned by Babur and not Babri Masjid. This is the first one where he brings in that magnificence of the doorway. A people who were familiar with Mughal art would require that the doorway dominated the entire narrative. You can easily make out before, between pre uh, Mughal and Mughal architecture by just looking at the doorway. Where the doorway dominates, the, the Bulan Darwaza, as we call it, uh, dominates, then it's, it's Mughal. That's the first example. So what I'm trying to say is that we go around, we, we are familiar with lots of things, but we don't know. With the WhatsApp and other conveniences available now, uh, this sort of continuous messaging could easily be done can easily be done, not only of this, but once installed, one could always be reminded of the story, the story that it's not, that's not possible to hang up there all the time, could always come in. Now, we have gone over this entire domain of public art to whatever extent by eliminating certain, uh, certain uh, negatives, by including some, by dropping some, as I said, dropping of architecture was only for convenience. But architecture is the finest form of, finest form of uh, public art. Remember the Eiffel Tower, that was meant for one year. It was meant for one year, but of the millions of pieces that joined there, not a single nut has fallen since 1889. That is it. That is it. It's poetry in steel. Poetry in steel. Now, uh, Suresh had been, uh, they had been talking about the, uh, the uh, no, Abhishek 
also mentioned about museums. Now, Abhishek has done excellent, outstanding work on museum. Perhaps uh, he's earned his way into world fame because of his dedication, collection, and philanthropy, which has shot him up. But the first thing that we need to watch out in public spaces is museum. A museum is a restricted access closed area space. Even if it's open free, the fact that it is free doesn't make it any less forbidding and doesn't make it any less overwhelming. So I would say that while taking ideas and things from museums, one should avoid it. People mentioned to me about the Shepal uh, Amsterdam's museum that they have an art gallery. So every time I've seen that picture, I've seen only one lonesome lady looking at it. <laughs> no, if people wanted to see modern art, they wouldn't come to the airport, precious modern art. They would go to the airport. But anyway, it's a, it's a gesture in tokenism. Let it remain. Their paintings must be duplicates or whatever. <laughs> I don't know. So these are, these are pitfalls we need to we need to guard against, guard against. I would end with uh, the last uh, story since I ended with the Eiffel Tower. I must tell you this, this real story. Naresh spoke about apocryphal stories. I'll tell you this is a real story. Not fully relevant to the subject, but pleasant to end with. When Gustave Eiffel, or Eiffel was asked in a Paris club, a snooty club. And uh, this was the time they were discussing genetics, environment, and other factors that lead to greatness. He was often asked that, you have nothing. Monsieur Eiffel, you have nothing. What they were hitting below the belt was that Gustave Eiffel's mother was a Shah woman, a woman who went from house to house to do menial duties, by or whatever you call it. And his father never did anything well. He was a drunken poet. And little Eiffel's duty was to drag his drunken father from the pavement and bring him home. He said, so when we talk of heritage, when we talk of linear gifts, when you talk of familial gifts, genetic gifts, you have nothing. Eiffel said, thank you for the compliment, but let me tell you, from that low-class woman whom you have described so beautifully, I learned how to be practical in spite of adversities. I learned how to execute what I wanted. And from the drunken father that you mentioned, that poet, drunken poet who never did well in life, I learned how to dream and make my dreams come true. So that is a lesson that one we keep in mind, that it's a combination of an inspiration with aesthetics rolled in, with a certain amount of public acceptability. The fact that it's public space, the, what I started with, immediately draws upon, is immediately brings you within a particular discipline, even if that public space is owned by you. Because if public are transiting through, it's public. And it's more dangerous if that public space is owned by you, because then we'll know where to blame. Whereas in an open public space, we often don't know whether to blame the municipality or the mayor or whatever. So here we know. So. The aesthetics, the first demand would be an acceptable aesthetics. And without going in for Nazi definitions, I would still say that acceptability can still be measured out. It can't be, it, it's not that impossible. It has, it has to refrain from revolting. It can be, parts of it can be polychromatic to attract general masses or children, 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 the most neglected group, the ones that the kids uh, toy market capitalizes on, and we completely ignore them. The TV consumer goods market targets only kids, 
mainly kids and housewives. So keeping these factors in mind, since you're going in for a venture, I would submit that the constraints, the, the points that negate a good work should be kept in mind because once we put in, once an investment has been put in, once a design has been done, as long as it's not government property, which can be dismantled by the government and has been done at times, a private property would have to be suffered like the entrance wall, like the arrival hall of Delhi airport. We have to suffer it all our lives. I go in like this past it. Please notice this next time you go to Delhi airport, what I'm saying. And you, you yourself, once, once you look up, you will be revolted at the very architecture and that huge amount of money that went into developing that. With these words, I thank you very much for your patience while I elaborated in my own way. I usually don't carry written speeches because I try to react to the environment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.